Kleinere Haveri, ma schönen Dank für den Kommen auf den dritten Tag von unserer äh, Konferenz. Äh, die Hasmode äh, ist beeindruckend und wir schätzen das stark ab. Um, uh, I will uh, present uh, the um, following session in English, uh, but I remind everyone that we can um, all speak in English and in Yiddish. Both are the official languages of the conference. So um, the, the following um, session is dedicated to translations uh, from Yiddish. Uh, as in the title, Translating Yiddish, uh, New Messages for New Audiences. And um, uh, it is a great, great pleasure uh, to uh, welcome Alexandra Glebovskaya, um, who is a graduate from St. Petersburg Saint, uh, State University with a degree in literary, uh, in, in English literature. She attended Elga uh, Line, uh, Lineskaya's uh, Seminar of Literary Translation in the St. Petersburg Union of Writers. Uh, she works as a full-time uh, literary translator and translate uh, fiction, non-fiction, poetry uh, from uh, three languages, English, French, and Yiddish. And she is a member of the St. Petersburg Uni Union of Writers and the St. Petersburg International Pen Club. Um, her talk today is entitled Self-Translated Suffering, Masha Rolnikat's uh, Ghetto Diary in Yiddish, Russian, and English. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, ich einem Dank und es ist vor mir ein großer Covid zu sein da auf der Konferenz. Es dürft mir, als ich bin uh, die uh, einzige Übersetzerin noch uh, nicht in Akademik da und mein uh, ich, ich rede Jiddisch uh, uh, nicht uh, mit sieben Fingers und dann will ich uh, reden uh, Englisch. Uh, and uh, yeah, once again, thank you very much for um, inviting me here. And um, it's a little bit uh, uh, it's a little bit hard to speak in this um, academic environment for someone who is more of a practicing translator. But um, I will try to share some insights uh, on a text that um, I feel is quite important as a text and as an example of um, Yiddish being branded in uh, other languages. So uh, could I share screen, please? Uh, you see that? Not yet, but it's coming. Good. It's okay now. Here we go. Um, so here you see are uh, basically two editions of so one and the same book uh, in Russian and in English. Uh, it's called Ich muss berzählen in Yiddish. Uh, it's called Yadoshna Raskazet in Russian. And it's going to be called I Must Tell. Uh, in English once uh, it is published in English. The book by the Bill No Getter survivor, uh, Masha Rolnikaite. Aveg Tsuzik is the name Professor David Roskis has chosen for his course on Yiddish autobiographical writing at the Tel Aviv Yiddish Summer Program. The point of the course was to show that Aveg Tsuzik gate durch verschiedene Sachen, such as Kinderjorn, with the child's mentality first being introduced to the Yiddish literature through biographical writings rather than fiction. Geschichte, Kuckwinkel und äußerst Kekoyes. Tracing the Yiddish autobiographies back to Isaac Maid Mayer Dick and analyzing the uh, order fictional works of the major Yiddish writers, Roskis insists that any autobiography is a polyphony of voices including the voices of the protagonist as a younger and older self, us and the others, and the narrator. While a multiple perspective of what Harriet Morav terms uh, a multivocal register is a general feature of autobiographical writing, 
picked up by the Yiddish literature as a fully shaped device of the broader international tradition, there's definitely a number of special Jewish features that inform autobiographies in Yiddish. For once, apart from their multi-voiced quality, they are by definition multilingual. This has to do not only with the author's command of languages, and they normally speak more than one, but with the nature of the environment where languages other than Yiddish are being used and should be used to broaden the audience. Remarkably, the final book of essays by the Vilna Ghetto survivor Masha Romikaide is called in Russian, Put Damoy, Aveg Aheim, thus echoing Roski's approach. But for her, the way of her autobiographical writings was not a way to self, but rather a way out in order to reach the broader audiences, uh, the broadest audiences possible, and to make them aware of the ghetto and camp experiences, not as a personal ever level, but as a part of the destiny of many people. Masha Rolnikaite, aka Masha Rolnik, aka Maria Grigorievna Rolnikaite, was born in 1927 in Plunge, Lithuania. Let me show you her, the way she looked in those years. Uh, in a Yiddish speaking family that subsequently moved to Vilnius. In the course of the first 14 years of her life, Vilnius went from being a part of Poland to being a part of the new Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic. Uh, Masha spoke Yiddish at home and went to a Lithuanian school. Her Russian before the war, according to herself, was rudimentary but later she picked it up with almost miraculous speed and learned it to perfection in the post-war years. As she worked as an administrator and translator at the local Philharmonics and studied creative writing at the Gorky Literary Institute in Moscow. When Vilna was occupied by the Nazis in June, 1941, Marsha's father managed to leave the city in the nick of time. While Marsha was stuck in the city together with her mother, her older sister and two younger siblings. They all ended up in Vilna ghetto. After the liquidation, Marsha's mother with the two younger children was sent to Auschwitz where they all perished. And Marsha went through two concentration camps, participated in the March of Death and was saved by the Red Army at the very last moment. Throughout these experiences, Marsha was writing a diary in Yiddish. Her notes were lost more than once, but as her mother insisted that she learn them by heart, Marsha was able to put everything on paper once again from memory when she returned to Vilnius after its liberation. With us half as the basis of her biographical writings, a diary of a 14, 15 year old girl subsequently rewritten, supposedly verbatim, by an older person. And it is quite obvious that in such a rewriting, self-editing would be unavoidable. Marsha managed, however, to keep her terse matter-of-fact style and a touch of romanticism that is appropriate for her age. Throughout the Stalin period, there was no chance to publish her notes, but Marsha was persistent and the diary um, ended up uh, being published first in Lithuanian as Turu Papasakoti uh, in 1963, then in Russian in the major literary magazine Zvezda in 1965 as Yadal Shnaras Kazat, and eventually in Yiddish as Ichmus Bertselen in Warsaw in the same year. Marsha did all the three translations herself and prepared all the books for publication. The Russian version in particular went through rather heavy editing with some politically sensitive issues omitted, but also with the style spruced up by a very competent editor. We have to keep in mind that what was technically a diary went through several rewritings and reiterations done by the author at various stages of her life with the written Yiddish version preceding the Russian one, yet the Russian one preceding the printed one in Yiddish. And it's hard to tell how much mutual influence they had exerted over each other. 
Apart from her natural gift for words, Marsha was quite an experienced self-taught translator. Part of her job at the Philharmonics was to translate texts of the songs that were to be performed from Russian into Lithuanian. So dealing with her own text, Marsha probably without realizing it, uh, worked out a very efficient translation strategy that is amazingly apt and imaginative. And I would like to point out a few distinctive features. First of all, her work with the rhythm was impeccable. She reworked uh, uh, the structuring of Yiddish phrases quite freely as she created the Russian version, but she retained the same very tense rhythm, making one think of the staccato uh, rhythm of a schoolgirl's diary. Let me show you uh, an example. Um, here we have um, the quote in Yiddish. Um, this is actually the very beginning of the published uh, diary that you can read for yourselves. Uh, then there is the Russian version, which very few participants can read, even though some can. And then there is the English rendition. And uh, let me just read the Russian version for you so that you could compare it to the Yiddish one uh, written-wise. Раннее утро, солнце светит весело. Наверное, от гордости, что оно разбудило весь город, привело в движение. Я стою в воротах нашего дома, дежурю. Конечно, не одна, вместе с соседом из восьмой квартиры. В последнее время дежурят все, даже мы, школьники. При объявлении воздушной тревоги дежурные обязаны созывать прохожих под воротами, чтобы улица опустела. Now, uh, there are some uh, minor differences in the phrase structuring between the Russian and the Yiddish uh, uh, texts, but uh, each time um, it is uh, well justified. Um, for instance, uh, here we have the, the, the phrase, Umetum Ruderzich un Esis Lebedik, which is um, a separate phrase um, in Yiddish, while it is kind of attached to the previous sentence in Russia to make the flow smoother. And because the phrase, uh, uh, the, the first phrase in Russian is uh, shorter and more tense, we basically um, end up having the same rhythm uh, in both of them. So uh, her work with, with the rhythm is actually quite amazing. Uh, with uh, equal power in Russian and in Yiddish, Marsha builds up uh, by rhythm and syntax, this framework for the most uh, meaningful and uh, memorable phrases. Uh, in fact, uh, for a translator, this is also always a major challenge and one of the key tasks to determine the most crucial unit in a paragraph and not only render it adequately, but also um, to uh, properly structure uh, its surroundings. And um, again, let me uh, show you an example. Um, this, is, this is one of the most poignant uh, phrases in the whole uh, text, when the family uh, after the ghetto liquidation is waiting for what is to come next. Basically, it's the middle of the night, they're in the middle of a swamp and uh, they have two children on hand and uh, little, her little sister keeps uh, asking mother questions. She doesn't fully realize what is um, going on. And um, so uh, basically there is one uh, crucial part of uh, this phrase, which kind of became one of the symbols of this uh, book and of Marsha's message. Uh, on one, uh, when men, uh, uh, the schist, would be. This is, this is rendered as a phrase that a child would pronounce, and Marsha very aptly uh, renders it uh, in Russian, uh, the way a child would say it, but uh, the previous questions are rhythmically structured. They're not as important as this one, but they're rhythmically structured as a lead up to this uh, most important one. And again, she manages to do a very fine rendition uh, in Yiddish, uh, in the original text, where she probably verbatim quotes the words of her little sister that she might have remembered. And she manages to do the same in Russian by um, imitating the speech of a child and uh, by um, creating the rhythm that leads up to the crucial one. 
and then uh, there is a very interesting way Marsha intuitively works with a concept that in fashionable modern terms is called foreignization and domestication. Uh, from multiple sources, we know that a Yiddish text has to be, a, a Jewish text has to be a Jewish text. Otherwise it's not kosher, it has to have the Jewish flavor. And here Marsha again intuitively uh, works uh, a very tricky device into the fabric of her Russian translation. Uh, in her text, uh, we won't find any words or expressions that would be readily identified as Jewish, uh, which in Russian very often are loan translations from Yiddish used extensively by the native Yiddish speakers in their Russian speech. Uh, Masha's text is both foreignized and domesticated. It's cultivated Russian with a natural flow, and yet once in a while we can detect subtle shifts of meaning that estrange it and indicate that the speaker's Russian is not standard Russians. Like in the paragraph quoted above, you can now see on the screen, Vivolt Dimame Besser Vern is translated as Kudam Amahatiela Beluche, literally, where mother would better be, which is a slight shift from the norm, but uh, thus uh, we get special flavor. In another episode, when Marsha as a camp inmate works on a farm for a German ballet boss, she says that they had to spend the Sunday sprucing up his Yontavdike uh, Fayatondo, uh, which is translated in Russian, the word Yontavdike is translated literally as Praznichne, literally festive part. And again, this is not the normal usage for the Russian language, but it doesn't run against the language. It just gives the text a little flavor of uh, foreignization. Uh, so this works very, very aptly uh, together. Uh, also, we have several examples of Marsha translating uh, something from Russian back into Yiddish. And this is quite remarkable because she claimed that uh, by the end of the war, her Russian was almost non-existent. But here we have an example. She has just been uh, helped and assisted by two Red Army soldiers. And uh, the, they supposedly say in Russian, don't cry sister, no one's gonna hurt you again, which she renders back in Yiddish. We nicht schwester, men will tut nicht losen dir by Bavelen, yep. Uh, so this is this is quite an interesting way how uh, for Masha it works back, back and forth, how she manages to uh, keep control of both languages. And we have no idea whether she somehow managed to re remember the phrase in um, a foreign language and then render it in Yiddish, or she probably immediately translated it for herself uh, at the moment when it was said, because it was a very dramatic moment. And then she kind of found a Russian equivalent for that. But uh, the point is that in both languages, it is being uh, very natural and very um, easygoing. While discussing her literary heritage, Marsha would repeatedly say, I would gladly sacrifice my three languages for the sake of one, English. Indeed, with Marsha's lifetime quest to make the story of her suffering, uh, of the suffering of her brethren accessible to the largest audience possible, an English translation would have been a major breakthrough. Weird as it might seem, however, even though Masha's diary has been translated into a number of languages, including Finnish and Japanese, no English translation was published in her lifetime. The reason was aptly summarized by Sheva Zucker, an avid admirer of Masha's work, who went to great lengths to make her known in the US. She was a little bit too communist for that, which, which, which is um, slightly true. Marcia would have been delighted to learn and she passed away in 2016. And that's what she looked like in her later years. Uh, 
that uh, after her departure, her archives were transferred to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And we are now working on the English translation that Kane and Ori uh, will be published in the foreseeable future. It was Marsha's express will to have the Russian version used for the purpose, even though we now know that um, it's the one that was most heavily edited and self-edited. And as we work on the translation, we actually sometimes take a look at the Yiddish version because sometimes it is uh, more clear and straightforward than uh, Russian. And that's from my point of view, in Ya Dalsnara Skazaitz, Maria Grigorievna Rolnikaite offers us a much needed template of working on the translation of the Jewish texts to make the text flow naturally in the target language, not to overload it with pervasive Jewishness and yet give it an unmis unmistakable flavor of Yiddish kind is something very hard to achieve and something to strive for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander, for this fascinating uh, and uh, enriching presentation. I'm, th I'm sure we have many, many questions. So I see one question from Shimon Neuberg. No? OK. Uh, uh, Mr. Dimschitz, do you, is that no, a no, question? No, no, no. no OK. Any questions or remarks? Gennady? I was muted, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, we need this, yeah, we're quite busy. She's very interesting, I don't know, Alexander, she's very interesting. Yeah, for me, that's very interesting, well, by me, that includes another thing, another tickle, like, the third thing I'll say here. On, on, Так мене щось так інтересант суфер гвашно оді цей афідиш он афлушеш, але фармір із плейт афрагі, он де фрагі із фармунного їх мит майндер фарм фунарбут і на журнал. Де захас, де захис аз де советиш редактором, хом кін рахмонес не піада. Зе флегн ібер шрайб де текст ганцов. Ich habe gesehen, Roman, was ist gewesen ein Manuskript und zwischen jeder Schule ist gewesen der Text übergeschrieben von, von dem Redaktor. Und äh, wenn wir reden wegen, äh, in dem Fall, wegen Marsha Rölnig oder Marsha Rölnigs äh, äh, zwei Texten, dachte sich mir, also wir wollen sich Kämmel nicht mehr wissen, äh, seitdem, Kann mir euch suchen die Manuskripten und vergleichen mit dem Wortbuch, wo ist äh, ihr Text und wie, wo ist der Text, wo ist es angeschrieben von dem Redaktor. Wir fragen noch, also kurz die Redaktoren, jedenfalls die erste Auflage von äh, äh, Rolnikaites äh, Togbuch oder äh, Amin Togbuch, wo ist es alles in Litwisch, ist gewähnt, äh, durchgelehnt durch die Zensoren von einem Institut von dem Zentralen Komitee von der Litwischen Kommunistischen Partei. Ja. Und, und sie haben noch gebeten zu geben, das, was sie heute nicht gekannt sehen und so weiter. Ja. Ist bei, bei mir bleibt die Frage, äh, ich weiß nicht, wie so methodisch, also so so methodologisch, wie so kann man reden, äh, Wer so kann mir arbeiten mit den zwei Texten? Wo ist äh, die Mechaberte und wo ist die, der Redaktor oder die Redaktorin? Ja, ich I, I fully agree. Uh, however, our, the latest edition, the latest Russian edition, was out in uh, 2010 and Marsha had full command and full control over the text. They did reinsert certain omissions. By the way, sometimes fairly harmless omissions that uh, the original editor insisted upon. Some of those omissions are actually uh, are in the Yiddish text. So uh, that's 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 still um, a big question. So I think overall, Masha uh, never felt that she should completely rewrite the text. In her later years, she identified with this. Um, edition as far including these little 
really, really not very minor uh, um, changes that um, she insisted upon. But uh, I think we are looking here on a much broader question of um, um, the Granite's uh, exhibition fiction and auto fiction, or fiction and auto fiction, uh, uh, memoirs and auto fiction, because yeah, years go by, attitudes changed, and this text, including the original Yiddish text, has gone through so many iterations uh, that. Uh, I think for Masha herself, it was hard to say what was where. And even though we would never know the truth, um, I think it's probably very interesting to look at these multi-layered text because it's kind of multi-layered, not only in each of the translations uh, but uh, or in each of the versions, but it's multi-layered because it took years to put it together, not necessarily always by her own free will. So academically, I think it's, um, it's a wonderful challenge for someone, preferably with the command of Lithuanian as well, to make a more detailed comparison, because my comparison was more kind of along the practical lines as I was working with the text. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, uh... Yes, Yael Matveit is here. Sorry, today I don't have uh, my camera, I'm on, on some other computer. I have a question. Uh, Alexander, you mentioned that uh, Masha Rolnik, who lived all her life in Soviet, in Soviet Union, then in Russia, and died in St. Petersburg, uh, consciously avoid, uh, try to translate uh, her memory in a way that it sounds like a Jewish story. However, in the Soviet uh, Yiddish, it was not normally it was the opposite uh, tendency uh, i would say people try to translate whatever things thinking that yiddish is a normal language that can be used for translating whatever uh, con contents not necessarily related to jewish things so do you think that she used or she consciously uh, tried to uh, uh, insert certain Jewish things to make it sound more Jewish, or she did it unconsciously, or she was addressing Yiddish audience who would accept, expect uh, like uh, Jewish content. I would idea. say that most of her translation decisions were made unconsciously, uh, and I have a proof because our, in her very last years, I had a chance to work on her translation into Russian, and I could kind of see how her approach worked in practice. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that she was deliberately trying to make the text Jewish. In fact, even her um, uh, Yiddish text is uh, not necessarily Jewish. There's very limited use of Russian Kodesh words. On the other hand, there's quite a lot of kind of not borrowings from, from, from the Russian, but I, I would say it like Russian syntax and so on and so forth. So, but uh, she did manage to give this text a flavor. When you read the Russian book, you feel that there is some sort of a different feeling to it. Uh, you, you, you feel that this uh, book is not necessarily translated, but written with a person who has a different uh, command of words, attitude towards a uh, different idea about how the words uh, uh, work together and so on and so forth. And to me, this is, this is an important feature because it's uh, important. It can be used in a broader sense for uh, translation from not necessarily just Yiddish, but for Yiddish in particular. Yeah, my second question, I'm sorry. Uh, do you think that it is possible using uh, this example uh, or other examples to render some story that originally is totally not, not a Jewish story using some type of vocabulary and certain certain words into a pseudo Jewish story? Yeah. Like by translating, for example, Russian or English into, into, into Yiddish. This is, this is a very, very big question because I would love to spend a couple of conferences discussing how you specifically translate from Yiddish because there is a lot of specific, um, why should I tell you that, you know, uh, issues? But uh, my answer is yes. I, I think this is, this is one of the possible, very feasible and verifiable approaches. 
Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you both. I think we uh, unfortunately don't have time for any more questions, but we do have our um, discussion uh, at the end of the day where we can um, uh, once again uh, talk about everything that we couldn't talk about during uh, the questions. Uh, so uh, I am very, very pleased to present our upcoming speaker, Daniel Kahn. Uh, Daniel is a uh, graduate of the Michigan uh, University with a BTA in Dramatic Writing. He lives uh, in Berlin since 2005, where he fronts the punk folk klezmer band The Painted Bird. He tours the world as a singer, songwriter, translator and teacher. He translates into Yiddish uh, and translated works, uh, it translates songs into Yiddish and translated works uh, by Leonard Cohen, for example, Brecht, Dylan and Brassens. He works as a director, playwright, uh, actor and songwriter and as the former music curator at the Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin. In 2016, he was the Ashkenaz, uh, the, um, Ashkenaz Foundation inaugural Theodor Bickel Artist in Residence, I'm sorry for that. And in 2018, he received the Hanna and Josef Mlotek Award for Yiddish continu Continuity. His writing has been published by Jewish Quarterly, Die Zeit, Asymptot, and the Smithsonian Folkways. His talk today is entitled Yiddish Song Smuggling, Tradaptation and Polyglot Performance in the 21st Century. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. And shalom aleichem, all of us. I will read in English, but this is a tale from a paper that I have written in my mama in English. Uh, uh, let me share this screen here and see if it'll work. Uh, are you all seeing the, the, the black square of Malevich? Yes. Okay, let's put a map up. Europe. I got that courtesy of the Medem Library. So, yeah, um, by the way, so I wrote that bio when this was supposed to be in Paris two years ago before the plague. So now I live in Hamburg uh, and I'm no longer at the Gorky Theater. <laughs> Um, but the rest is mostly true. <laughs> All right, so Yiddish song smuggling. Uh, Tradaptation and polyglot performance. Double click to edit. All right, I consider myself, I'm not an academic uh, by any means. Ich bin a positive lead arbeiter und epis a stickel übersetzer. I consider myself a kind of immigrant in the world of Yiddish. As a singer and songwriter with a background in theater, uh, one of my primary modes of engagement with Yiddish has been to render Yiddish songs into singable English. Uh, I also do tra translate into Yiddish, but I'm, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Um, when encountering the, first Yidd encountering the first Yiddish songs that really spoke to me, uh, I was struck by the limited ways in which meaning could be conveyed to a non-Yiddish literate listener, such as myself at the time. Um, I found that performers relied heavily on uh, spoken summaries of a song's meaning, recited quickly with a, a vamp from a guitar or an accordion, uh, and they would say, you know, when the rabbi Elimelech was very joyful, and then eventually the Yiddish singing would begin. And this seemed to be a kind of awkward and rather ineffective means of cutting through the cloud of sentimental non-apprehension, which hovers over many audiences of Yiddish music. Rather than connecting an audience to the immediate human relevance of a song, it functioned to preserve the nebulous aura of exoticism around Yiddishkeit. Uh, so I, I found that the effective translation of a song's lyrics out of Yiddish, with all of its deep idiomatic traditions and, and inherent musicality, it demanded all of the aesthetic considerations present in the composing of original poetry or songs, 
One must have an ear for the flexibility of vernacular modalities in Yiddish, Germanic, Slavic, Semitic modalities, as well as an awareness of the effects and expectations associated with contemporary performance of Yiddish for a largely non-Yiddish literate oilum, whether that means audience or world in general. Um, indeed, the word, the term translation only partially applies to this process. Referring to the process of free adaptation, the German term Nachdichtung, literally after composing, comes closer. Uh, I'm told that in Norwegian, the term and usage is, and forgive me if there are any Norwegian, <laughs> Norwegian speakers, Gindiktink, <laughs> which literally means again lyricizing. Um, and perhaps, perhaps preferable to me would be tradaptation, which is, uh, I thought I coined this term, but apparently it's used in theater discourse. There's a French Canadian poet and uh, director, Michel Garneau, who used it. Um, but perhaps actually the best terms would be the Yiddish nusach or gilgul, because they imply interpretation, movement, and transformation. A song is recreated in the uh, in it's recreated in the new idiom uh, without violating the spirit of the original. This requires a combination of translation strategies, depending on the performance's context, audience, and cultural function. As as much as translation is an act of close reading and transmitting an existing text, it is also necessarily a mode of creation and recreation. So I guess here I'll quote David Roski's. Uh, with um, every act of recreation is essentially subversive and every successful recreation is always parasitic. Um, I'm interested in parasites, so I really love this quote. Um, in light of this, translating a song is somewhat like breaking into and occupying a house. One looks for an open window, a breakable lock, an easy entry, and once inside, one makes sure no one else is there and then goes room to room taking what can be used and learning the structure of the house, eventually one must go back and fix what had to be broken to get in and then it's done. The song is squatted. This may be a somewhat violent metaphor. Um, Tradaptation need not imply violation, but violation and liberation can be two aspects of the same act. Tradapting the gesture. So Walter Benjamin, I guess we have to mention him famously and somewhat cryptic, cryptically prescribed that the task of the translator consists in finding that intended effect upon the language into which he is translating, which produces in it the echo of the original. But what does this echo sound like when the translation must also function as a musical performance that both entertains and elucidates the original? All too often, uh, singable translations don't work because they attempt to render too literally the original language yet still strain to rhyme. These two concerns, uh, if given too much consideration, can overwhelm a translator's ability to make the work idiomatic and lyrically musical. Many examples of this can be found in, uh, here, let's, yeah, in, uh, in bilingual collections of Yiddish songs published for the non-Yiddish speaking Jewish American youth of the post-war era. For example, in Jerry Silverman's uh, Yiddish songbook, uh, and I don't mean to cast too much shade on him, but uh, I love this book. We find a version of uh, modern Yiddish author Moshe Nadir's folklorized um, anti-Hasidic parody, Der Rebbe Lemelech, which I mentioned before, and in Silverman's singable translation, as the Rebbe Eli Melech is given Zeyefreilech, is set in English as Eli Melech, our rabbi, once was feeling very happy. Okay, so uh, one can assume that the word rabbi is meant to sort of rhyme with happy and not the other way around. Um, should a singer try to compromise and sing Rebbe and happy? I don't know. To the degree that the translation is playful, one could possibly make it work, but it doesn't do what one called justice to the original or to the rabbi for that matter. It goes on to sing of phylacteries for tefillin and a cape for a kittel and symboling symbolers 
Uh, and it even has uh, an asterisk footnote for uh, Havdola. And if you're requiring people to sing footnotes, then maybe you're not doing your job. Uh, in this case, the issuance of a license for poetic liberty might have been in order. On the other hand, one mustn't go so far in this poetic liberty so as to lose touch with the gesture of the original entirely. Um, uh, my favorite example of this can be found in the East German volume of Yiddish songs Es brennt, Brüder, es brennt, edited by legendary singer Lin Yaldati, uh, and the GDR poet Heinz Karlau provided German Nachdichtungen of many beloved Yiddish folk songs. The same quote from before is Germanized in his version as Als der Rebbe Elimelech ist geworden etwas fröhlich. So etwas fröhlich is not exactly the same as sehr fröhlich. It seems that the recontextualization of the song to German required a slight mitigation of the rabbi's enthusiastic joy. One artist who managed to strike uh, an impressive balance in his song translations was Theodore Kell. Uh, the translation is part of his process in making a song his own. Daniel, um, maybe you could repeat. Were then used to help. Daniel, yeah. I think I you were. It? Yes, just uh, the two last sentences, please. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I'm in a hotel in Weimar. I have no idea. The um, okay. Um, so, did did you hear me mention Theo Bakel? Oh. I think we 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 uh, heard the first part of the sentence. Okay, so one artist who managed to strike an impressive balance in his song translations was the great uh, Theodore Bekel. He often spoke of translation as a part of his process in making a song his. Uh, so um, he once told me that he, he'll stay up all night long for a rhyme. Um, but he also knew when rhymes weren't necessary. Uh, in his book, uh, Folk Songs and Footnotes, um, his version has, when the rabbi Elimela felt a happy mood upon him. So already uh, the flow of the translation is a little more balanced and eased. His translation goes on to not rhyme at all, but the voice of the English is assured and unforced. And indeed, it's the voice of Bekel himself. Uh, his is a case where translations are tailored by and for the same performer. Um, and as I went to try to make songs my own, I thought a lot about his effective voice and the role of translation in his work as a kind of cultural or an intercultural folk ambassador. Um, so I would like to look for further illustration at, at the very first song that I ever attempted to tradapt out of Yiddish. Uh, and the ways in which it departs from the original or it tends away from being a faithful translation, as well as choices about rhymes and structure, editing and reordering uh, in, in the performance. Uh, so the very first song that I ever attempted was Juliet Juliet Beza Vinton, um, which you see here, I hope it's not blocked. Uh, Juliet Juliet Beza Vinton by Avram Rezin, it's based on his 1901 poem. Uh, zum Winter, it's a chestnut, it's a standard of, of, um, of kind of Bundist repertoire. And I found the song in Pearls of, Pearls of Yiddish Song, edited by Hanna and Joseph Molotek. The first verse, Juliet uh, Juliet Beza Vinton, which in the, the Molotek book was translated, Howl, Howl, Raging Winds, quite literally, rule the world without constraints, smash the branches, hurl the trees, do whatever you will. So. Uh, I was immediately struck by this song's violent and powerful irreverence. Uh, at the time, I, I didn't know it, but it would, it would go on to be a staple of my repertoire. I often open concerts with it. Later on tonight, I'm playing a concert. I'll probably start with this song. Um, it, it doesn't grow old. Um, so in 2005, I encountered the song and started to perform it. I was here in Weimar at Yiddish Summer Weimar, working with Michael Alpert. Um, and uh, I made a translation of it um, for my own purposes, just as a singer. 
And uh, I, I, I started, I wanted to approach the song as I would one of my own, as if the translation were the original and the Yiddish were a guide of where to go. For that time, for the for, for the first time, I came to understand that the original language is itself a kind of translation of the author's ineffable original inner gesture. Um, so I was trying to translate that, not the song. And what I came up with was wailing, wailing winds of evil play upon the land, fell the trees and break the branches by your raging hand. Already I had to jettison several key images from the Yiddish. Um, there was no ruling. There was no uh, uh, do what you will. Um, I reverse images. Um, later on, I render Brenta Lichtel Ergitz Tunkel, Lesht mit Sorgenois, as if in darkness shines a flicker, kill that fucking flame. Now, rather than simply translate the word Sorgen, I transplanted it into the first verse and let it inform the gesture and performance of this verse through the use of an, ex of, of an expletive. Um, is it faithful to the original? No. But I felt that it embodied a a deeper fidelity to the original gesture of the song, one of scorn, defiance, and indignation in the face of injustice. The song really came to life for me. Um, so it was the first of what would become an entire repertoire of hybrid Yiddish-English songs. Um, when I perform it, I perform starting in Yiddish to allow the music of the original to define the emotional parameters of the performance. Uh, and um, beginning with some ethereal noises and wind effects from the accordion. Uh, and then I, I go later on, much later on in the performance, I go into the English. So the first half of the, the song to a non-Yiddish speaking audience is entirely musical. Um, and there I, I would reference something what my partner, our comrade and friend, Soy Korolenko, calls spell art, um, which is the, the musical function of, uh, of, 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 of a foreign language. Um, I, yeah, I'm, uh, so, so here I, I, would, I would jump to, yeah, translating the context as well as the content, um, which is an important function. So, uh, Yeah, the, uh, I found that the traditation of old songs addressing human struggles and troubles had an uncanny ability to, ref to reflect our present world through the lens of the past's forward-looking eye. But the adaptation of a song from one linguistic idiom to another wasn't enough. I had to find a way to refigure the song's context as well as content. Songs of czars and kings had to become songs of our current political and economic rulers. Um, for instance, when creating an adaptation of Mordechai Gebirtig's Arbitzloser March as the March of the Jobless Corps, uh, the lyric about the exploitative leisure of non-laboring rich, wie die Gewirim pust und pass, became in English, idle as a CEO. And for me, this is, this is a translation, but it's, it, it's a translation of the context as well as the content. And it brings together the original with the, the original past with the present Yiddish and English, Zinger and Oilem. So coming a bit to a close, I'll come to the, the, the title track. Uh, for the past several years, I've increasingly performed accompanied by projected surtitles created by my wife and partner, the translator, dancer, and video artist, Yeva Lapska. This was certainly, this was inspired by work that we had done in the German, Yiddish, and international theater worlds, where surtitling is increasingly the norm. In our age of ubiquitous text-based communication and intercultural media saturation, the addition of a visual linguistic level has become an effective uh, and indispensable component of polyglot performance, the use of Iberkeplach. 
Um, likewise, the flexibility and portability and availability of digital projectors and presentation programs like this one I'm using here have made this kind of multimedia performance possible in nearly all venues, and it allows for a kind of diversity of strategies when doing polyglot performance. You don't only need to translate songs into singable versions. You don't only need to explain songs beforehand. You can also use titles, either projecting translations, projecting the sung text as you're using it, um, and it also opens up barriers to folks who may be hearing impaired. Um, so uh, taken together with the process of singable lyric adaptations, the borders of language, culture, musical genre, and social historical context have never been more permeable. One need only embrace the art of the smuggler. Um, so in the Jewish criminal cant of the medieval Alsace-Lorraine region, there was a deeply clever way of referring to a smuggler, a neinsikev. It literally means 90 -er. So uh, my, and many others, you may know, uh, Avram Lichtenboim, he was my teacher many years ago. Uh, he told me about this term. Uh, it's a thousand year old term from Mayrev Yiddish. Uh, so, Amongst smugglers or neinsikers, they wanted to avoid any word that would be understood by German or French speakers, such as contrebandier, and the name. So they chose to riff on the French for the number 90, 90, which was not a far leap to contrabandist. It's an example of the ways in which Yiddish can erode and subvert borderline. to one particular official national territory, Yiddish carries countless traces of all the languages and cultures in which it's lived. Um, as the cliche goes, I speak dozens of languages, but all of them in Yiddish. Or to borrow from a more current uh, German phrase, Yiddish is a language with migrations hintergrund, as I am. Uh, this multiplicity of contexts, this baked in border crossing poses certain challenges when attempting, attempting to translate out of Yiddish into another language, but it can also be liberating. As Yiddish literary and translation scholar Anita Norwich put it, uh, of necessity then, one must, uh, Yiddish, ah, wait, mm -hmm. yes. Sorry, I got it. Of necessity, then, Yiddish has always been permeable, open to other literary influences, looking to other languages and traditions in dialogue with them. This multilingual cultural exchange may make Yiddish literature particularly adaptive to translation, despite popular notions of its untranslatability. Like a smuggler with contraband, the task of a modern Yiddish song translator requires more than simply creating an accurate rendering of content in a new language. One must translate the gesture and spirit behind the song and allow it to express itself in the new idiom. As a lyric translator and composer and singer and theater artist, my engagement with Yiddish has been concerned not only with, with the crossing of cultural, linguistic, and historical boundaries, but with subverting and complicating them. Um, so if, as Susan Sontrag said, that the circulatory system of world literature is translation, then it is vital that our songs are, and the human stories they contain not get stopped at the border. And I think that's uh, my 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. This was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I think we probably have many questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. Uh, I believe Alexandra may have a question, yes? And I'll, yeah. uh, it's actually not a question, but uh, I just want to say that Daniel, I'm your ardent admirer, not just as a person, but as a political translator. And uh, sure. over the last two or three years, over and over again, I've been discuss in discussion with my American uh, colleagues who would say, no, 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 translating poetry and rhymes, keeping the rhythm, this doesn't work, it never happens. And I say, go to and look at Daniel Kahn's works. That's how it should be done. So, Shane Dunk, thank you. You are a template, just especially, especially in your translations of Abu Java. So, oh, know. thanks. Yeah, that's. So I think uh, Arnaud has a question and then we will hear you at Matveyev. Yes, um, I have 
Uh, actually, uh, thank you very much, Daniel. It was really great. I have um, one remark, which is uh, uh, that I I wanted to link the what, what you just said uh, about the the spell art uh, and the idea that the the language is here more uh, for for sound and symbol as a sound and symbol more than as a content. Uh, bearing instant that that really reminded me what michael uh, lukin has brought uh, one or two days ago about uh, uh dunai 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 and the way uh, romanian and russian was was there's something traditional in this then that's that's really great that you are uh, meeting this again now uh, it, it's not only something post vernacular. It's, a, it's a, something that was uh, ingrained in 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 Yiddish, and that's really interesting. And uh, my second uh, question, it's a question, is: um, Do you sometimes get some reaction from the public uh, about? your translations. Does someone come to you uh, enraged and say, what, well, what does a CEO do in this uh, Yiddish song? <laughs> uh, well, no, I, 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 no. I, I, get, I get angry reactions about other things. Um, <laughs> I wish I would get more angry translation reactions. Th those are the ones that I'm really, those are the arguments I really would like to engage in rather than talk about politics all the time. Um, I, I, I mean, actually, uh, Alexandra mentioned the Akujava project, and and I think that that's that's a situation where I think there were much, I was dealing with really protective feelings about the untranslatability of of Bulat Akujava's work, and also, I mean, ich bin a halbe Yiddish redner, you know, and I'm but ich bin nicht kein halbe Russisch redner, you know, like for that project, it was really working from a language which I don't speak at all. And so I I took more liberties with Akujava than I was able to with Yiddish because I understand the original better in Yiddish. Um, I, I, it, it depends, you know, I, I, I haven't found people really being upset about violating the work of uh, Mordechai Gebirtig or, or, I don't know, maybe Tal will get upset with me with the way I'm working with Aaron Seitlin now, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's, um, I don't know. I, it, I always, I, I, even if people don't get upset, I try to be careful, um, but not too careful, careful, but not precious. Thank you. I appreciate you. what you said, by the way, about the, 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 the non post vernacular thing, but you know, it's, we, uh, I come from a tradition of reformed Jews who don't even understand the prayers that they speak every week. So in that case, it's a, you know, Hebrew as a kind of pre-vernacularity. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, de dealing with incomprehensible incantations is, is deep in, in at least my tradition. In mine as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see two raised hands, but I believe Joel uh, had uh, previously asked to ask. Sure. Yeah, thank you. I have a question to Daniel, uh, who mentioned our mutual friend Soy Korolenko, uh, who sings uh, many Soviet and Russian songs translated into Yiddish. Mm -hmm. uh, I do kind of the same we translated lately. I translated many Russian classic so Soviet songs into Yiddish. What do you think uh, could be another possible trajectory to be translated into Yiddish? Because I can think of many possibilities, like English, Irish uh, pop songs, uh, could be Spanish ballads, can, could be like Italian, uh, like can do many things translated. So what do you think would, would be a very interesting project to go next after uh, Russian translations? Well, I mean, for me, the songs kind of find me often, you know, I, as I, I'm serious when I call myself a lead arbiter, you know, I take the jobs that I get. Uh, I, I've recently translated a song by ABBA into Yiddish because somebody wanted it. I, I was just working in a workshop with someone who translated some Iron Maiden songs into Yiddish. I believe I know what it is. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, 
the, the song will let you know if it wants to be translated or not. <laughs> and, and very often the, the answer remains no, and then it just, you leave it alone. Um, but general languages, I mean, I would love to hear some Francois Villon, <laughs> uh, oh, really interesting but I'm not the one to do that. Yeah. But I think the uh, difference between uh, English in comparison to French and, and Russian is that English has very strong dif dif differentiation between long and short vowels. It's kind of difficult to translate them into, uh, into Yiddish in some cases, unlike uh, some other languages like Russian or French that don't have... Well, I, I I would I would respond I would just simply say I, you're not like what I said in the paper like you're not translating from one language to another you're trying to find the same song already within the language that you're translating into if that makes sense yeah. you know the 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 nuts and bolts of of a language play more of a role in the ability of that language to express roughly the same thing that the other version does. So, I mean, English is a very rhyme poor language. Russian, Yiddish, German, French, th these languages have rhymes built into them very basically. And English really doesn't. English, you want to write a good song in English, like a good country song, find an idiomatic cliche and recontextualize it lyrically, and you'll have a hit. That's 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 how English works. It's uh, as as Nabokov talked about. Actually, he was talking about Akujava. He said, as a popular. Um, sound is gone. Poet, his job is the inspired juxtaposition of idiomatic cliches, and that is a pretty good de description of my job. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Saul, um, what is your question? I, I was wondering if you could uh, sort of following on our nose question, tell us uh, instances where this didn't work, where the methodology you're, you're describing kind of failed, whether it be something in the, in the act of translation or if thinking about spell art, the audience moment, right? This attempt to find multiple audiences to appeal to all different kinds of people with t super titles, with translations, with spell art. When did that kind of mixture or amalgam of different kinds of strategies feel like it didn't work for you? I, I feel like, I, I mean, I'm a big fan, obviously great work, but when, when do you feel like there was something that didn't exactly come through? Well, that's a really, really great question. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if there's a, there, nothing springs to mind because I do, I work so hard to banish these experiences from my, from my memory if, if things don't work. But um, I'm just looking, I, I, the, there are some songs that I, that I, that I perform with with Pasha with Psoy as part of the international, where I think it's like you re I mean, if the content doesn't work, you tweak the context, right? So you find a way of framing it, it as part of a larger discourse between songs. But there are several songs there where I, if you were to just perform, let's say, uh, a song like V Halik is the Natur, which is like a late 19th century revolutionary hymn, sort of a pre Bundist revolutionary song. It, it doesn't, I don't perform it a lot because it, it doesn't land without a very specific context of discourse. Um, and it doesn't have the same, it doesn't pack the same punch that it might have 130 years ago in Russia. Um, so yeah, th that would be an example of, at least of my translation, not, not carrying the weight of the, the adaptation. Um, other things that, I don't know, uh, there are other translations I've done into Yiddish where it's so close to the original. I feel like, why am I doing it? Like I did a translation of, um, uh, Das Lied der Moldau by Bertolt Brecht and Hans Eisler, where, yes, I guess it's kind of interesting that I'm singing it in Yiddish, but it's so close to the German, like, why not just sing it in German? Um, 
that would be an, an example. Thank you very much, Daniel. I believe Alexandra has another question. No, I don't know why my hand is still up. <laughs> the, the, yeah, it's like a strange situation where our hands get stuck up. <laughs> Mindle, please, I think, yeah. and then Isabel, if we have time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm thinking about, I'm curious if you have thoughts about how tradaptation and, and the kind of process that you've developed, does it translate to literary translation? Have you thought about or talked with other literary translators and how this, you know, is it specific to the kind of performance work that you're doing? And what would it mean if it were in our textual practice? And I think the reason I'm I'm really curious is that the Yiddish translators, you know, we work within the fellowship. The the one of the core kind of challenges is the tension between like the responsibility that people feel and the weight that they feel to to do right by the originals, especially when we're not native speakers and we have this long distance from the original kind of cultural context, and how much better translations are the freer that we are right by taking that poetic license and when translators give themselves permission to translate beyond the word and the sentence and to think in these broader ways so that that's such a core kind of challenge for the work that we're doing and you are you're doing this wonderful example of like here's how good this stuff can be if we really take the license to kind of adapt in this broader sense so yeah does it how does it, how might it cross over into, into textual literary translation? Well, that's a great question. And it's, I mean, it's an ongoing, the, 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 the tension between these processes is very palpable in, in, in the work. I mean, like you said, everything that I do is, is oriented towards performance. And in that regard, I think that there's a, temp, there's a temptation or a misconception of translating songs to relate it somehow to literary translation, when really it's much more useful, I think, to, to consider it as a sort of, that it, it inherits its process from the theater rather than from literature. Because, you know, to, tra to translate a play necessitates it being a functional performative text. And that's why tradaptation is a theater term. Um, I think that you can look, I, I, I get, of course, a big, kick out of the work of, of uh, Douglas Hofstetter. He wrote this amazing book about um, the musicality of translation where, you know, he famously translated the same French poem like 700 times. Um, there's a great book called uh, Le, the, uh, his book, I, Le, ton, Le Tombeau du Moreau. Um, and, and of course, there's his very free and playful rhyming translation of Yevgenia Negin, which uh, Vladi Vladimir Nabokov hated, I'm sure. Um, in terms of translating prose, I don't know. I, my, my instinct is to say, like, if you were doing a children's book, it should be freer than, than right. a novel. But I don't know. Why, why not tradapt novels? I mean, we see that in... In uh, I, I, in Robert Bly's translation of Knut Hamsun, I think there's a lot of tradaptation going on there. Um, I think it all depends on the job and the parameters that you give yourself with the job. You know, um, as I said, I don't know who issues the poetic licenses, but you know, find out what office you should apply to, and if if they give you one, then use it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we have uh, time for a last, last quick question by Isabel. And I just want to apologize to Alexandra that I didn't uh, give more time to questions because I didn't realize that this session is longer than the other ones. So I do apologize. Uh, Isabel, please. Yes. Um, th then, did you? Um, I don't remember. Did you fi finally sing the the Brassens song? Yeah. I, I, so Isabel is asking about a song by Georges Brassens that um, she helped 
no, no, translation no. that no, no. It's, it's, but is a translation that I did together with her daughter Eleanor Bizunsky. Um, and uh, yes, I've performed it several times and I've recorded it as well. I have a solo record coming out later this year called Word right. Better. And, and it'll be on there. I had another question, but I think it's it's kind of stupid, but uh, I'll ask. Um, translating Brassens and uh, Bulat Akut Java, did you find commonalities? Uh, because I yeah, always very... had this very strong feeling for for both musicalities, rhythm, uh, contretemps, uh, all, all these things that you find in both, but maybe I'm not a musician and I'm not a specialist of uh, comparative literature. So as a translator, I think you can say. I, uh, well, I, I mean, I translated, well, we translated the Brassens into Yiddish. Uh, and I was translating Akujava into English, but I feel that Brassens is actually kind of a connector between two different worlds of kind of guitar poets. You have Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan on this side of the world, and then you have Akujava and people like Vysotsky and Franz Josef Degenhardt, Wolf Biermann on the other side, and Brassens may be right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know Brassens was a big hero of Akujava, as far as I've heard. Oh. And, um, I think they even knew each other personally. I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. That might not be true at all. Um, but uh, yeah, you know. When you have a coup de blues, it's one or the other that you listen to. Yes. When I have, I'm sorry, you broke up there. I, I... Uh, when you have a coup de blues, when you have the blues, have a coup de blues. Coup de blues. It's a coup de blues is uh, to be blue. <laughs> to yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love it. <laughs> one or the other that you listen to. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, or, I mean, I mean, I mean. Yeah, or Hank Williams. You know, he's, he he helps too. Billy Holiday. Um, Thank you so much for for this. Uh, I've been in I've given a a COVID design zwischen. Uh, uh, the uh, cap, and uh, and I'm sorry I won't be able to be part of the the program later on the discussion. I have a gig, <laughs> but uh, I hope as noch amol af simches when when the MS in Paris next year in Paris. We hope stark. Leshon abo in Paris. Leshon abo in Paris. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. A großen Dank und äh, jetzt ist, äh, ist ein groß, groß Vergnügen äh, vorzustellen äh, unsere kommendige äh, Rednerin. I will do the äh, Unhaverte and I will do this in, uh, in English once again. Um, Malena Chinsky uh, is a postdoctorant uh, in the um, uh, Fondation de la Mémoire de la Shoah. Uh, she is uh, associated, uh, I'm sorry, I just, uh, yes, um, I'm so sorry, uh, my, my, my text uh, <laughs> uh, jumped. Uh, she is um, also associated uh, to the interdisciplinary uh, research group History of the Literary in the École des Études en Sciences Sociales. Uh, she co-edited with Alan Astro the collective volume Splendor, Decline and Rediscovery of Yiddish in Latin America, uh, published in 2018. Uh, today's uh, uh, talk today is entitled Translating Yiddish into France, Social Trajectories, Material Conditions and Cultural Projects. Thank you very much, Malena. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my um, uh, my work will, uh, in a way, continue um, the discussion we had yesterday in, in the roundtable regarding translation into different languages. 
Today, I'm presenting some, some findings regarding the history of Yiddish translation in France, which I developed as an independent project since my arrival as a postdoctoral fellow in late 2018. The idea of creating a database of all published translations came to me um, as a result of the outsider's eye, so to speak, and the convergence of the circumstances that I will relate briefly. On one hand, uh, my arrival coincided uh, with the publication of three extensive translations undertaken both by Batia Bohm and Rachel Hertel, as well as a volume, Memoir du Yiddish, uh, Memories of Yiddish, a series of conversations between Hertel and French journalist Stéphane Bou. Amazed with these discoveries, I was happily surprised, I was less happily surprised, sorry, by a parallel finding. In the list of new translations from Yiddish compiled by Inge Web for the year 2018, no section for Spanish existed simply because no item had been found for the record. However, um, one translation into Spanish did come out in 2018 and the website has been corrected. But the point is that the sudden awareness of the virtual disappearance of Yiddish translation activities into my language and the contrast with the vitality of Yiddish translation in, into French in the present made me think of undertaking a systematic study of the factors that resulted in, in such state of affairs. This is all the more the case as in the early 20th century, Buenos Aires became a vibrant Yiddish cultural center where a significant number of translations from Yiddish were carried out and published as conscious elements of cultural and institutional projects led by personalities such as Salomon Resnick and Leon Duhovne. And I refer here to a doctoral research of Argentine scholar Alejandro Duhovne. Interestingly, in the late 40s, while Salomon Resnick had already translated more than 20 titles into Spanish throughout three decades, the realm of translation remained marginal in Jewish Paris, which is our subject of study today. I mean, comparison remains the horizon of this work, but I am speaking of the French case today. Indeed, in an article that appeared in the Bundesdaily Unser Stimme, the Parisian Daily, in November 1948, a journalist signing as Henri Montmartre lamented the fact that in opposition to other foreign literatures available in French, Yiddish literature resembled a poor relative. Under such pseudonym, the future researcher and memory entrepreneur Henri Mincelles stated that in order to fill this gap, Jewish cultural institutions should elaborate a plan for the translation of Yiddish classics into French. Mincelles' observation regarding the virtual absence of translations is reflected in my database. Of the total number of direct translations from Yiddish published as a book in France since 1910, only a small number, less than 5%, had, had appeared in the first half of the 20th century. Even if a Yiddish world had already emer emerged in France since the 1880s as a result of migrations of Jews from Eastern Europe, translation from Yiddish as an intellectual and cultural practice did almost not develop, with the exception of a few pioneers such as Lupus Blumenfeld and Edmund Flegg. Before I add some context in order to try to interpret these numbers, let me provide some methodological clarifications regarding the construction of the database. The list elaborated by the Medan Library, which was mentioned yesterday by Gilles Rosier, was a useful point of departure, but my database does not overlap with it insofar as I have left out indirect translations, translation works published in literary journals, those published in countries other than France, mainly Switzerland and Belgium, and reprints. Finally, I have revised and completed the corpus, the corpus and took notes of paratex and other information, etc. I mean, no, no criteria is perfect, but we try to stick to our imperfect criteria, the, um, the most coherent way as possible. Um, in the aftermath of the Second World War, cultural life in Yiddish gained impulse in Paris thanks to the arrival of East European Jewish writers 
artists and political and communal activists. The newcomers joined those Yiddish speaking Jews who had survived the war in French territory. Among the thousands of survivors was a handful of individuals of various origins who had arrived in France both before or after the war, for whom translation became an aspect of their intellectual work, even if not their principal activity. This is reflected in a gradual increase in the number of books published in the 50s, seven titles, um, and especially in the 60s with um, 18 titles. Such undertakings did not make part of a systematically organized cultural program as wished by Minceles, but remained in independent initiatives of Jewish intellectuals native from Eastern Europe. The only exception to this uh, is the Alsatian writer Arnold Mandel. Since I don't have enough time to outline their trajectories, let us focus um, on that of the Polish Jewish poet Charles Dobzhinsky who made during this period his first steps as a translator, choosing works by the Lithuanian Jewish poet Dora Teitelbaum, who had left the United States to settle in France in 1950. Hidden in France during the war, Dobzhinsky fought in the battle for the liberation of Paris. Um, an autodidact, he became a poet in French, in French language, critic of cinema, chief editor of the literary journal Europe, and translator of several languages while always active in communist circles. He remained a productive translator from Yiddish until the decade of 2000. We shall also find in this early period, the first translation works completed by Rachel Hertel. Um, sorry if I say things that some in the audience already know, but um, I try to address uh, the, um, also um, the others. Born in 1939 in a village located in the Grodno region of Poland, Rachel Echtel survived the war in Siberia with her mother, the Yiddish poet Menu Haram. After having spent a few years in Lodz, they arrived in Paris in 1948, together with the Yiddish writer Moshe Waldman, Rachel Echtel's adoptive father. They settled in the residency for survivor artists and intellectuals located at Nefrogi Patan. Considering the ensemble of titles published until the 60s, I observed that in most of the cases, the pieces chosen by the translators were authored by living writers, among whom some were residing in Paris or had spent some time in transit in this city after the war. For instance, Mendelman, Dora Teitelbaum, Mark Dwozetsky, Joseph Weinberg. This fact shows on one hand I mean, this we already know, the richness of the Yiddish literary production in the aftermath of the genocide, when this language was still an important vehicle of daily communication for millions of speakers throughout the world. On the other hand, it speaks of a universe of readers in France, even if limited, who might be potentially interested in new works coming out in Yiddish, but unable to read them in the original. A few among these individuals continued to translate in, in the following decade when the decline of Yiddish, was a, 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 um, of Yiddish as a vernacular language was advancing. This explains or can explain why the number of published works remained stable in the 70s with 20 titles. Before new generations of translators emerged. Throughout the 70s, we shall find no new names of intellectuals who would dedicate to translation from Yiddish in a frequent basis. The profile type <clears throat> reflected in the database is rather that of a person having translated one work only. <clears throat> the increase in the number of translations in France throughout the 80s with 25 titles and the 90s, 26 titles, in a context of general decline of Yiddish, might be explained by the convergence of two main phenomena. On one hand, the emergence of new interest regarding Jewish culture within post-war generations, especially in the 70s. And on the other hand, the presence in France of professors capable of teaching Yiddish language and literature at the university level. In turn, this was enabled by the creation of programs 
for the study of minorities, result of the reforms brought up by May 68 and the reivindication of the right to be different. The, mod the modest ex expansion of Yiddish within the French university system was possible thanks to the efforts made by Rachel Hertel. Firstly, she became professor of Yiddish at the Institute of Oriental Languages and Cultures in Alco in 1963, where she joined Alexandre Dershansky, an Alsatian scholar specialized in the sociology of religion. However, the number of students remained small, as she tells in a memoir du Yiddish. The turning point took place in the early 70s when Artel obtained a post, a post at the English Institute of Parisette, where she succeeded in creating a Yiddish class by arguing that Yiddish was one of the minority languages spoken in the United States. It was in this environment where a group of students invested in the study of the language emerged. For Rachel Hertel, teaching Yiddish implied from the beginning an ambitious translation program and for such purpose, the training of disciples was necessary. Moreover, translating Jewish languages made part of the program envisioned by the circle Gaston Crémieux, created in 1967 by Richard Marien Strasse, among others, for which Jewish life in the diaspora was a central matter. Ertel was in turn one of its founding members. Her objective was, however, not to revive East European Jewish culture, but to preserve its memory in France. Her choice of translations aimed at changing the folklorist image of Yiddish, and I quote, it's my own translation of Ertel's um, words. What I wanted to do was to introduce modernity, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. It was the time of the avant-garde and experimentation in every realm of Western literature. I wanted to show that Yiddish was a sort of soundbox of all such upheavals, that it borrowed this honey and transformed it in its own flesh, through its own language and in its own vision, its own images, its own metaphors. As the Jews were part of world history, Yiddish was part of world literature." End of quote. In accordance with the principle of universality, none of the publishing houses chosen by Ertel for, for her books belonged or was associated to Jewish institutions. This pedagogical, literary, and memorial project undertook by Rachel Ertel began to materialize in the late 80s through the publication of, of a book collection deemed Domain Yiddish, Yiddish Domain, even though it's not a collection in the classic sense of the term, as its titles were actually not published by one same publishing house. Precisely, Ertel has described it as a, as a diasporic collection due to the periodic change of publishing house, which resulted from the lack of profit in publishing such works argued by the editors. Ertel's uh, apprentice translators also had the opportunity of studying with Mordre Litvin, arrived from Co Covno in 1939, and back in France after captivity in Germany. Finally, the arrival of the educator, lexicographer, and specialist of Yiddish literature, Itzhok Niborski, in 1979, lastingly transformed the Parisian Yiddish landscape. Born in Buenos Aires in 1947 and already a young Yiddish activist in his native town, Niborski became a student of Mordre Litvin and Artel. He became professor of Yiddish at Inalco and the chief librarian of the Medan Library. In spite of the fact that his view of translation as a means of preserving the Yiddish heritage, heritage has always been a pessimistic, and he's honoring us with his absence uh, today and throughout this conference, um, however, because um, he, he has always privileged the, the rigorous learning and daily use of the language among his students, he has uh, played a crucial role among translators in France. Niborski is always ready to provide advice regarding the choice of text to be translated and to carry out detailed revisions of the versions proposed, as well as scholarly paratexts for the books. In the 1980s, 
a group of translators who would become prolific later began to publish the first results of their work in an individual or collaborative basis, and here are uh, their names. Their choices were often in accordance, in accordance with Rachel Ertel's project. Modern writers such as Lamed Shapiro, Israel Joshua Zinger, Moshe Kulbach, Esther Kreitman, or Aaron Zeitling. I am being a little schematic, I'm aware. Nevertheless, translations dating from the years 1980s and 1990s cannot be exclusively attributed to the new generations. Rachel Ertel and Charles Dobzhinsky pursued their activities and other members of, of the pre-war generation began to translate, as was the case of Abbe Vievjorka, Maurice Pfeffer, and Nathan Weinstock. Um, finally, Batia Bonbon, born in Paris in 1941, um, is the youngest among the survivors who became Yiddish translators. Her first works saw the light in the 1990s. Batia Bam's trajectory is particular insofar as even though Yiddish was her mother tongue, the circumstances of persecution and life in hiding forced her to remain silent during the war. Having become a fluent French speaker, she relearned Yiddish in the 80s and soon became a self-taught teacher and translator. The first decades of our century saw the continuation of the work carried out by a limited group of translators who had been active since earlier. My database shows that among the 73 titles published between 2000 and 2020, let's go back to here. Um, among these 73 titles published between 2000 and 2020, approximately a third were translated by Rachel Hertel and Batia Bom only. Uh, Batia Bom's translations are not limited to one author or peri period of Yiddish literature. She made, for example, a French version of Mendeles de Cliace and Dos Winchfingel, as well as of Peretz's by Nacht of Alten Mark. She has also penned the translation of central pieces of the Corpus of the Writings of Destruction by Katze Nelson and, and Zalman Gradovsky. As an acknowledgement of the quality of her work, Batia Bom was granted two translation prizes, the last being uh, Le Grand Prix de la Traduction de la Société des Gens de Lettres in 2017. Most of Batia Bon's translations have been published by the Madame Library, a publishing house entirely dedicated to Yiddish language and literature, affiliated to the Maison de la Culture Yiddish. Each publication of the Madame Library, a nonprofit society, requires to collect funds. The books are not available in bookshops and can only be purchased at the Maison de la Culture Yiddish in person or online. Given the fact that its publication capacity is limited, and that commercial publishing houses manifest small interest in Yiddish titles, it is not surprising that many of Batia Bom's completed translations remain unpublished. In turn, among the most emblematic translations carried out by Rachel Hertel in the recent decades, we find the post-war testimonial novel um, A pas aveugle de parlement, um, Mit blinde triste af der Erde, by the Polish Jewish sur survivor Leib Rochman. Uh, a commercial success, as recalled yesterday by Gilles Rosier. Rachel Hertel received in 2020 the prize of the French Academy as an acknowledgement of her whole intellectual trajectory. And in addition, I would like to mention two translators belonging to the pre war generation who became active in the last decade Monique Charbonnel and Jean Spector. <coughs> a few members of the New Age cohort. Sorry. have interrupted their activities in the realm of translation for different reasons that exceed the frame of this presentation. The only new names are two female translators of the post-war generation, Isabel Rosenbaumas and uh, Evelyn Grombert. The database enables us to observe the slow emergence of generational renewal through the work of the scholar specialized in compared literature, Fleur Queen Kennedy. Last, I would like to refer now briefly to the book publishing market. The database reveals a variety of publishing houses involved with Yiddish works in translation. 
10 of them have edited over four works. Among these 10, only three have edited between 10 and 15 works. These numbers suggest a trend of, of, tempor of a temporary engagement with edit editing Yiddish literature by French publishers. In the case of Kalman Levy, even though covering a period of more than 50 years, as you may see in the, in the table, there is a gap of 30 years between 1975 and 2005. Translations from Yiddish do not seem to be a priority within publishers' catalogs in the present, the sole exceptions being the Bibliothèque Medem and L'Antilope. Um, even though a state agency gives limited funds for, the, for translation and publication of foreign literature in France, the Centre National du Livre, publishing Yiddish literature remains a financial risk for commercial publishing houses. However, we, we, have, we learned yesterday that this statement can be nuanced uh, as a few of the titles published by L'Antilope uh, were actually successful commercially. I would now like to contrast these facts with the aforementioned collection uh, Domaine Yiddish, uh, run by Rachel Ertel. In a public talk, Ertel mentioned that some 50 titles had been translated by her and her group of students since its origins. However, it is not possible to consult the catalog of the collection because it does not belong to any publishing house in particular. Indeed, the collection exists only in the realm of paratext or we may say in the realm of imagination. But regardless of the accurate number, it is safe enough to suggest that in the case of Yiddish, the personal cultural project of one individual has been more influential than all editorial initiatives together. And now I uh, come to, the, to my conclusions, preliminary conclusions. The corpus of translations from Yiddish in France produced throughout more than a century was mainly the result of the work carried out by two distinct groups. On one hand, survivors of the genocide in the large sense of the term. On the other hand, individuals belonging to two post-war generations who learned the language in most cases in the 70s and 80s. The situation has changed significantly since the moment when Henri Minceles deplored the absence of works in translation. Indeed, the corpus of Yiddish works available in French translation is larger than that of translations into many other languages. Paris remains until today a center of Yiddish translation. However, a question mark remains regarding its continuity. Thank, Thank you. you very and much. A great thank, Malena. This has been very, very interesting. Um, and I just wanted to mention that we are honored to include, uh, to have uh, Batia Baum, Jean Spector, and Isabel Rosenbaum uh, among us today. Uh, may I invite uh, questions? Yes, Mindel, please. Thank you, Melina. Um, this might be a question. I don't know if you can answer this question, but I, I've been wondering this since Gilles spoke yesterday. Um, how much the the kind of role of the reading tastes, maybe of French readers, has to do with the room for these translations? So this is really a question that is there. American English readers read so few literary translations, it's you know two or three percent, I think, of, of what's published in English is translation from other literatures. I'm curious if you have any idea if it's if that's similar in French language publication, and really, you know, the then these numbers of Yiddish translations are really remarkable, or is there more interest in reading translation in French? Not that that would explain it or make it unremarkable, but um, I'm thinking about our audiences, right? What's the openness to reading translated literature? And I wonder if you have any sense of, of that broader landscape. It's a very good question. Um, the reception of these works, um, I'm, for example, yesterday I kind of learned through Gilles Rossier's presentation 
Um, I was surprised to find out that uh, some of the books that, that he published uh, were received uh, um, and sold um, well. Um, I think uh, it, L'Antilope is uh, one case, and then Bibliothèque Medem is a, is a different thing because I don't I'm not I don't think Bibliothèque Medem is is addressing is thinking of an audience, um, and I mean uh, maybe other people in the audience will um, be able to also to give their opinions, but I think Bibliothèque Medem has a program and they publish works, but these works. Um, are not uh, necessarily um, meant to uh, reach a, a large audience or a wide public because they, the, their circulation is very limited. It remains in a, in a limited environment. While the case of a commercial publishing house, and I am I speaking of these two because they are actually the only two that are nowadays publishing Yiddish literature in translation. Um, as we've learned yesterday, the, the, um, the construction of the catalog, at least the Yiddish part of the catalog of Lantilop, is a, it goes a little bit of um, um, something comes up and uh, it, it, it doesn't respond to a previous uh, program or a particular audience. However, um, I would like to, this is a, my personal opinion maybe, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't like to think of, the, of uh, the readers and the audience and the public as a static entity because the public is constructed and is, it's, is dynamic and, and may grow. And um, um, the, Yesterday, uh, it made uh, Gilles Rosier's presentation made me think that uh, in the case of um, um, of Tsari Sharkatorge, that it was a success par um, regarding all the other titles in his catalog. Um, this is Ra Rachel Hertel's translation, and before that, Rachel Hertel's translation of Le Rochman had been a bestseller. So I think. Uh, there, there is a prestige that is being has been built throughout time and a symbolic capital constructed by the translator that is reflected in its circulation of a work and and, and sales. Um, so now that we, our uh, most renowned translators have received these important prizes, I think it's um, I mean something. To, um, that uh, publishers can, may capitalize really uh, to uh, uh, to reach to wider publics and to enlarge these publics rather than like uh, limiting to what uh, already exists out there. Thank you very much. I believe we have uh, two questions and then Gennady, uh, Arnaud, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Malena. I wanted to ask you, uh, well, uh, um, uh, before I, I ask one question, I wanted to to, to tell Mindel that uh, from what I have, uh, I know uh, French translated, translated literature into French is very popular. In comparison with the, the numbers you've given for America, it, it's just, uh, a huge difference. Uh, I know that uh, nearly 20% of the books published in France are from translation. Uh, well, it's not it's not everything literature, but it also it already gives you an idea that there is a, a, a very good reception for. Uh, uh, if you go in in any in any library in any bookshop uh, in in France, you you'll see that the uh, the shelves are uh, with translated literature are are as big as the shelves with original literature, nearly. Um, so that that might explain also uh, some of the good reception of Yiddish literature. And um, my question for Malena, I don't know, I don't really know if you, you've looked into it, is what you've done is, is really a, a, a 
diachronic study of, of the translation, then I think it's very useful and, and I'm very thankful for all this information. I was wondering if you have found some kind of similar study in other countries. Does there exist a, a study of the situation in America? Maybe someone does have an answer. If you don't, I don't know. That's my question. Um, the, the English situation is pretty much unknown to me. Um, in uh, for Spanish, uh, there are a few works uh, that can be consulted, but uh, maybe not uh, as an um, extensive uh, um, historical work. I I would like to create a similar database for Spanish. Um, I haven't had access to uh, evidently to Argentine libraries for a while si uh, since before the pandemics, and even if I was there a few months ago. So this will take a little bit of time, but um, departing from Alejandro Duhovna's work on the um, Jewish book, uh, the history of the Jewish book in Argentina, I mean, this is a great point of departure. Uh, his book uh, came out in Spanish and uh, recently in Portuguese. And um, he, he made databases with different criteria, but he has shared with me. So I think there is there, there is a um, a basis for a future a comparative study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valena. Uh, Tal, please. So I'd like to um, complete some information from the point of view of the publishing house of the Medem Library, if I may. Um, thank you so much, Melina. It was fascinating for me, and I learned many, many, many new things uh, from your talk. So basically, I would say that uh, the main difference between the publishing house of the Madame Library and other publishing houses uh, that you uh, mentioned is um, not at all that um, the Madame Library is not thinking of what would what would be interested, what would be interesting for the readers. Of course, there's. Uh, um, the question of who is going to read and what kind of book would sell or what kind of book would be read would be read is part of the process of, of picking uh, what what are the next titles to be published. I would say that the but there is of course a very very big difference, and I would say that it is from the point of view of the of those who produce those books, like uh, uh, from the point of view of the of the Falag itself. I would say that the, the main difference is geographic and temporal. So first of all. Uh, you did mention, or maybe I, I missed it, that a great part of the books published by the Medellin Library are actually bilingual, which create an interest for them also way beyond uh, the French reading uh, public or create multiple audiences for them. And also for just the French uh, translations, um, I can tell you from what we know is that the proportions of buyers from around the world are proportionally much higher than for other books that are published in France. So because, as you said, the distribution is mainly directly from the library, uh, geographically, the readership is actually much, much faster. Um, this is geographically. And secondly, temper, temper, like from a temporal point of view, um, I discussed with uh, Maurice Hollander, maybe some of you know him. He's an editor, very, very famous editor in, in France. Um, and he told me that uh, from his point of view, whatever you manage to sell in six weeks, this is what you will be able to sell for the rest of the life of that book, like for years and years and years. And this is, this is true for the majority of publishing houses, like from a market uh, point of view, and not at all for the Madden Library. So our, um, the, the temporal, let's say the temporal um, model uh, from a, from from a, the point of view of of of, of selling the books is that uh, we publish a book, we wait ten to fifteen years, and then the tirage is over. So basically, it's not just people buying the book at the beginning, but the fact we 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 sell the books throughout uh, years and years and years. And I think that uh, it has to do with yeah with the kind of with the kind of books and the kind of the kind of image that the publishing house has a uh, worldwide as a publishing house that serves Yiddishists or serious people, serious readers of Yiddish. And in that case, it's uh, I thought it might be interesting 
to add. I have no question. Just wanted to uh, to add that. And uh, yes, this is it. Basically. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Tal. Uh, Gennady, did you have a question? Or I'm muted here. So uh, it's, it's not a, a question actually, but it's a question, but it's also a comment. You know, it, in general, I, I'm listening, it's very interesting. Uh, I, unfortunately, I missed the first day, but uh, the second and the third day, it's yeah, exceptionally. Uh, um, and I'm thinking that maybe we need, uh, my impression that we need to have uh, really a comparative uh, research to, to understand the place of, of Yiddish in the general landscape of translations, because I believe it's quite, can be very misleading, you know, the, of course we know that in, in, in Europe, in, in non-English speaking Europe, uh, the percentage of uh, translations is much higher than in, in the English one, but we're speaking not, not simply about translations, but translations and the market of essentially a heritage literature. The bulk, I believe that the bulk of those who buy such books are still Jewish. And it, it is no case that in the 50s, in the 60s, look, Sholomash was obviously very popular am among the uh, people of the generation once removed. You know, their parents were Yiddish speakers and, and uh, their children were still interested in the stuff and, and reading. And we can find a similar phenomenon with Bashevis here after, after the Second World War. And, and now, as I spoke, yes, my impression, that Bashevis doesn't exist on, on the market. People simply don't recognize, the younger generation, they don't recognize the, their name. So maybe to look into similar uh, uh, developments, I'm thinking how many uh, uh, books translated from Russian into English, and not speaking about contemporary, we're also speaking about something written in the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, take someone, I don't know, Platonov or, or whatever, Bulgakov or, or something, translate it into, into English, how many copies you can sell in the United States? And how many people uh, who come from Russian-speaking families would read it or, or, or grandchildren of Russian speakers? simply to understand what what uh, the situation is and, and maybe uh, if we apply only one yardstick the yardstick of how many copies uh, would we sell is one story and we apply if we apply I understand that the second yardstick it is very difficult to apply because to publish you need money but uh, but but to apply still the second yardstick how useful it is and how important it is to create you know, it's, you know, this literature, a reflection of, of this literature in, uh, in another language. And what Tal just mentioned, it is really a different market. It's not a market of the first six weeks, but it's a market of, of years and, 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 and years when a person comes to, to, uh, to uh, the Madam Library or an, another place and uh, uh, because of his or her interest in, in Yiddish and, and Baizu, because it's, it, it is uh, uh, necessarily for a class. So I believe that we, we need a, a very important thing to have a study, a study, a comparative study, uh, in uh, with various countries, various uh, translations and various target groups. Yeah. This is what, what, what I just wanted to mention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, uh, uh, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, we have a short break now. Uh, so we will reconvene in uh, about uh, 20 minutes, um, uh, quarter past five, uh, in, in 19 minutes exactly. Uh, and uh, this will be our final, uh, so to say, session. Uh, we will have um, our second and final um, uh, planetary talk by Hannah uh, Kornfeld, which will be entitled Beyond uh, Trans Untranslatability, Translatability, I'm very sorry, uh, Yiddish, Hebrew and Harshav's Collected Poetry. And after that, uh, we will have our final discussion. Thank you, see you shortly.